All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Rockland Community College. My name is Brian Conybear. I am now the special advisor to Governor Andrew Cuomo on the new Tappan Zee Bridge project, and we greatly appreciate your all being with us tonight. We'd also like to thank Dr. Cliff Wood, the president of Rockland Community College, for his commitment to the community, for allowing us to use their facility tonight. It's certainly a beautiful room, uh, a wonderful turnout. Thank you all for being here. Uh, on behalf of the governor, what we are dedicated to doing is holding 50 to 100 of these public meetings, large and small, across both Rockland County and Westchester County in the next month or so to try to inform as many people as possible about the constantly evolving plans here for a new Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, there have been some major milestones that have just been reached in the process in the last few days. Uh, three bids were delivered to the state last Friday. Tell you a little bit about those tonight. The final environmental impact statement was released by the federal government yesterday. We'll give you an overview of what that means and some of the unprecedented efforts to mitigate the effects of construction on a new Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, we have some of our esteemed experts here who know this process much better than I do. Uh, they have been working on this literally for years and years and years. Uh, and I would like to introduce some of them to you right now. First, we have Tom Madison. He's the executive director of the New York State Thruway Authority and the New York Canal Corporation. He's also a former commissioner of the New York State Department of Transportation and federal highway administration, uh, administrator at the U.S. Department of Transportation. He knows these kind of things inside and out from both federal, state, and local level. Tom, thank you for being here. Uh, we also have with us Mark Roach. He is a principal at Arup Engineering project manager for major construction projects like the Tappan Zee Bridge. He's worked on complex bridge, rail, and highway uh, development projects around the world. Mark knows an awful lot about this. Also with us is Larry Schwartz. Larry Schwartz is secretary to Governor Andrew Cuomo, and he is a former deputy county executive in Westchester County. Thank you for being here as well, Larry. Also with us is Karen Ray. Karen is the Deputy Secretary to the Governor for Transportation. She also served as a top aide to U.S. Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood in Washington. She was a key part of President Obama's High Speed Rail Initiative. Uh, also with us is Dave Paget. He is an environmental counsel from the firm of Sive, Paget, and Rizel. He knows all the legal ins and outs of this process, and this is being overseen by the federal government. The Federal Highway Administration is the lead on this, so we have to follow all of their laws, rules, regulations. Uh, also with us is Amy Vargas somewhere. Amy has become uh, my partner in this road show as we take this on the road and try to inform as many people as we can about the project. Hopefully you got question and comment cards outside. Fill those out. We're going to try to answer as many of those questions as we can tonight after we give you our presentation. Uh, and if we don't actually get to your question card tonight, I will personally respond to you. If you left a phone number or an email address, I will respond to you within 24 to 48 hours. That is what the governor has asked me to do, is to answer your questions as best I can. If I don't have the answer, if it's a technical question, if it's an engineering question, I can go to these guys and they will help me get the answer. Uh, I'd also like to welcome all of our partners in government. We will hear from them this evening as well. Thank you all for being here and supporting the Tappan Zee Construction Project. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of history. We're calling this building a new New York Bridge. Uh, you live in Rockland, right? So you know the Tappan Zee Bridge is outdated and overcrowded. Uh, more than 138,000 vehicles cross the bridge every day. That's far more than it was designed to handle back in the 50s. Traffic jams and delays are a regular occurrence. You know that if you use it. Uh, the accident rate on the TZ itself, the 3.1 mile span, is actually double the average accident rate entire rest of the thruway system, 574 miles of thruway, the Tappan Zee Bridge is the most accident prone section of the whole thruway. Uh, there are of course no breakdown lanes, no shoulders for emergency vehicles or disabled vehicles. So if somebody so much as gets a flat tire, it can cause gridlock for thousands of commuters. If somebody uh, runs out of gas, you know, something that simple can just cause a massive chain reaction on that bridge. Uh, and if, if well, well aware of that. Uh, the expected cost over the next 20 years for maintenance and structural rehabilitation of that bridge, because right now it is not up to structural standards according to the federal government, especially when it comes to things uh, like seismic uh, things. 
uh, earthquakes, God forbid. Uh, that would cost three to four billion dollars over the next 20 years to bring it up to federal code. Uh, the amount already spent on the bridge maintenance, just keeping it up and running, all the deck replacement, the painting, the usual maintenance over the past decade has been $750 billion. So a lot of money has been spent to maintain the current span. And more than a decade has passed since the state first announced that they might replace the Tappan Zee Bridge. In fact, it was Governor George Pataki back in 1999 said this on WCBS radio, quote, we are looking at the possibility of completely replacing the Tappan Zee because it is so old and does need such major repair. Uh, well, ten, more than 10 years later now, 430 public meetings have been held on the future of the TZ. There have been 150 different concepts discussed, $88 million spent on various studies, but nothing has really been accomplished. Then Governor Cuomo took control and ended the dysfunctional discussion accelerated a comprehensive and thorough review process that incorporates all the past studies. So that $88 million figure, that wasn't wasted. All of that knowledge that's been gathered over the past decade is moving forward in the new span as well. He also got a historic design build law passed up in Albany. We'll explain what that means a little bit later in the presentation, but it should make this project much more affordable for taxpayers. Uh, he's also assembled a team of national experts to take a look at this, to work on this, and to make sure it is a success and to try to mitigate the effects for residents who live around the bridge. And the plan for this new bridge, it should last a minimum of 100 years before it needs any major structural repairs. And in fact, it should last much longer than that as long as 150 to 200 years. Uh, so, Without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Tom Madison, the Executive Director of the Thruway Authority. He's going to go into a little bit more about the options on the table and how some of the decisions have been made so far. Tom. Good evening, everyone. So when the governor took control of the process, as Brian just described, it became apparent that there was really three options to consider. First option is let's keep the old bridge in place. And what would that involve? Well, you already heard some of the cost factors from Brian, but it essentially would involve us spending about a billion dollars over the next 10 years to maintain the structure in the fashion that it currently is. That means keeping it in a state of good repair, keeping it safe, but having no additional amenities, basically maintaining an obsolete structure. Over the next 20 years, it would require anywhere from three to four billion dollars in more significant capital investments older and older, uh, some more structural and more expensive repairs that would be required. And we still would not see any appreciable difference in congestion. Uh, we would not have a different safety profile than we have on the existing structure. We would not have possibility of transit. Option two would be to build a brand new bridge as we're discussing and moving forward with now, but also incorporate a county transit system. And of course, uh, we, this, this option was discussed and there was a lot of deliberation about various types of transit alternatives over that last 10 year period uh, of alternative explorations and deliberations. What we know is that transit is very expensive. And in particular, when you think about bus rapid transit, which really the focus of a lot of discussion in public, public uh, that would effectively double the cost of the project that we're looking at today. It would involve many more years of additional study and additional permitting and environmental reviews. So we arrive at option three, which really is the most uh, most sensible, the smartest option, well, given the situation that we're in right now, given the economic circumstances, but also given the need to replace this bridge as fast as possibly can. That's $5 billion today, state-of-the-art, transit-ready structure, a new bridge that will give us more general-purpose lanes for traffic to utilize, we'll have extra wide shoulders on the new structure. We'll have emergency lanes so that vehicles can access uh, access motorists when they're broken down and help get accidents cleared more quickly so that the congestion will be 
deviated considerably. We'll have a dedicated bus lane capability. Express bus service will be enhanced the day the new structure opens, and there will be a dedicated bikeway and pedestrian walkway on the new structure. We'll also be incorporating different ways to manage the new structure and operate the uh, facility better and differently. A lot of engineering advancements in 1956 when this bridge was built. Uh, a lot of new technologies have been brought online that we understand better and differently. So we'll be incorporating new technologies like sensors, real-time information to motorists about congestion, delays, weather issues, construction incidents. Uh, also, we'll improve our toll collection capabilities on the structure. mentioned, you know, reducing congestion, uh, certainly having a safer bridge than what we currently have just by being able to access the bridge, creating better options for the bus commuters that currently cross the bridge using express bus by enhancing that service, and having a structure that has the capability of using any type of transit, incorporating any transit option at the local community collaboration with the state and federal government decide uh, makes sense in the future, decide what's affordable for the future. That could be bus rapid transit, or it could even be heavy commuter rail, because the structure that we build will be able to accommodate any of those transit get all these new features and all of these uh, additional improvements to the to bridge, at the same time we're going to create or sustain at least 45,000 jobs in the lower Hudson Valley at a time we really need. Mark Roach is now going to talk a little bit more about what bus rapid transit is and, and some of the environmental issues uh, concerning the project. Mark. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I'm an engineer. I've had the benefit of part of those studies that we mentioned. There's and I have the opportunity to sort of tell you about some of the details that we've learned. And one of the things that we've looked at closely is RT. I just want to spend a moment or two on that. As a lot of people have, have commented that it's very expensive and it seems way out of line with some of the RT systems around the world. Why is that? Well, let me get to that. But first let me tell you what's the characteristic of RT, rapid transit. It's a train with rubber tires. Just like a train, have to be able to depend on it. You have to be able to say, I know that that train or that bus is going to leave that station at 1051. I'm going to be able to get home at 1121. You need to have that certainty, that reliability. So the bus has to feel to you like a train. You have to be able to say, as a mother or father, if I go to work, and something happens to my son or daughter, I know I can get home on that bus in 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it is have to trust that reliability. Because the day you don't trust that reliability, you will never take the bus again. If that bus gets stuck in traffic, never take that bus, bus again, you won't be able to do what happens in an emergency, what happens in normal life. And to make that system reliable, it has to be in dedicated lanes. You can't let the bus in normal traffic, because you know what happens out there, seven, it backs up. You can't let the bus get caught in that because you need that bus reliability. Instead of calling it BRT, bus rapid transit, bus reliable transit, we can use the phrase that's used. And to make that, so I've had the opportunity to look at, say, across from Dorchester to Suffern, what does it take to put dedicated lanes at 30 miles? And we've gone Location by location by location, and I can see lots of familiar faces here today. Uh, <laughs> Try and understand what that is, because we must accept that we're not building in the countryside. We're building in, in a community that's up against the border, right of way, through way. We all live here, it's not an open space. And that means that we can't just go through a cemetery with a BRT and those dedicated lanes. We can't go through some homes. We have to recognize that there's, there's an interchange there that we have to go over or under mountain that we have to go through in a number of places. To make dedicated lanes happen in this corridor is a very expensive thing. There's just so much urban nature to the corridor. 
It's not like any other corridor in town. Around the world, frankly. If this works, I'll go to this. Here we go. So just to give you an idea of the scale of the, the study that we looked at for the bus reliable transit. If you went, wanted to use the system, for example, the idea is that you should be able to walk out of your house, potentially in New City, get onto a bus that's 500 feet away from your door, go down local roads, get onto a dedicated lane across the corridor, across the bridge in Westchester, potentially get off at the Palisades Mall, sorry, at Latin at Mile or in White Plain. And you can do that without interruption of traffic, guarantee you're going to get there except for the odd day when the weather may make it. But that's the sort of system that we have in mind. And it's a full system. If you don't have a full system on day one, and you know you can get everywhere you need to go, you won't use it either. But so where would we put it in the highway? Where would these dedicated lanes fit? And, and this is a little location in, in, in Rockland to give you an idea. We could put see, the BRT in the center, or we could put it on the side. If we put it in the center, imagine this. You've got to think. The northbound and southbound true throughway and shift them apart by 30 or 40 feet. An enormous project. Imagine 15 miles of shifting that apart. Imagine the cost of moving that whole highway. And look at the numbers underneath that on the left hand side. The, the splitting of the highway costs three billion dollars. Because we have to cut into the mountains, we have to do redo all the interchanges. We have to create the space in the middle. It's the moving of the highway that makes the BRT expensive in this area. The second number there, the 0 0.4 billion. Once you have the highway in place, BRT is a relatively inexpensive mode to put in. And that's what happens around the world. People have the corridors to offer it, to put the BRT on. We don't have that luxury here. So BRT in this location is expensive to get that dedicated lane, to get that reliable service so that you can trust it and now, on the right-hand side, we looked at it in a slightly different way. What happens if we put it on the side? We put BRT on the side of the highway. We don't have to shift the highway. And again, we ended up with, well, actually, when we come through this interchange, when we come through interchange 11, top of the hill, how do we fit that lane on the side? Because we actually have to cut into the mountain that's right there. We come down from interchange 11 all the way down to the bridge. can't go through the homes on the north side there. If you're on the south side, well, you're going to have to cut into the Palisades Hill itself. It's a very expensive and complex engineering thing to put those dedicated lanes in. It's not, any, it's not the normal condition. Uh, you're probably getting a feel for it. In fact, we did look at what, what it would take to do a shorter route. We just went from Palisades Mall to Tarrytown. I'm not sure that makes sense as a system, but if we just did that, because of all the constraints that are out there and having to support Palisades and redo the cut at the top of the hill and interchange 11 and 9. Redo interchange 11 to make things connect, make a station. It got extremely expensive. And it's almost $2 billion to move the highway around and to get over all the conditions and the constraints that we have to do. What I'm trying to say is that we've looked at it in great detail. And putting in BRT is, is just not an easy thing in, in this location. Um, I mean, effectively, people probably remember what it takes to do the 287 in Westchester and all the construction that's happening over there, you're doing the same sorts of things here. It's that scale. Um, so Mark, and if I can just emphasize something that's on this slide here to, uh, tonight. Uh, a number of weeks ago, I publicly stated that uh, if we were to move forward with building a new bridge, as well as trying to do a full build out of a bus, I like to call it reliable transit system, as opposed to rapid transit system, you were looking at a $10 billion project, putting aside the community impacts of widening roads. I, you know, I'm a Westchester County resident. I remember in 1997, they talked about widening 287 with a dedicated HOV lane. And every community from Tarrytown to Portchester in 48 hours came out against it. And at that time, Governor Pataki rocked the idea and the plan for that. But I mentioned that if you're looking at a $10 billion project, uh, when the bridge opens uh, in 2017, you're looking at a 28 to $30 toll to use the bridge. And that doesn't include the cost to both Westchester and Rockland County when it comes to station maintenance of those bus stations, which means an impact on local property taxes, 
it's a way too high now, and that's why the governor introduced the proposed the property tax cap. So when you look at the other options, knowing that a full build out of, of um, bus rapid transit and a bridge at $10 billion is a $28 billion toll in 2017, and you know that option three certainly makes a lot more sense when you're looking at just getting that brand new $5 billion bridge with four lanes with an emergency service lane with two shoulders and the traffic and the gridlock and the trucks sitting at the toll booths idling and, and emitting uh, particulates. You know you're looking at probably in 2017 uh, a toll that's at least half of that, probably, possibly less. So you're looking at something in the neighborhood of $14 a toll. Now, the, if you look for, further south of you along the river at the George Washington Bridge, in 2015, the toll on the George Washington Bridge is $15. When this bridge opens in 2017, it's going to be on, and that's a cash price, $14. If you have an easy pass, it's less. If you have a commuter easy pass, it's at least 40% less. But Two years after the George Washington Bridge is at a $15 toll, you're talking one or more dollars less. And if you take the option one, which is basically the do-nothing approach, keep the same bridge in place, just keep fixing, fixing, put one Band-Aid after another, one gauze pad after another, you're looking at a $12 toll uh, approximately in 2017. So 12 or the existing bridge that has no emergency vehicle lane, it has no shoulders, so if you break down, the car can move over and traffic can continue to go. A bridge that would not have a bike and pedestrian path, a bridge that would be state of the art where it can improve aesthetics, I think lower noise, better air quality. You're talking about literally a one to two dollar difference in the toll, as opposed to a fourteen dollar difference on a full BRT. So the governor is clearly committed to mass transit and he wants to work with our counties and our towns and, and villages to figure out what is a viable option. There will be a dedicated HOV lane, I've stated it publicly, uh, at least during rush hour for buses on the bridge. Uh, and we'll work with the local communities to figure out a smart long-term future solution when it comes to mass transit. But we can't do it in a vacuum because any potential solution is going to have an impact on the quality of life, both on the Rockland side and the Westchester side. And we have to do something that's going to be both smart as well as affordable. And at the end of the day, someone is going to have to pay for this. And we have to be smart in how we approach it. So I just wanted to add that so people just see the practical reality of this thing and the common sense. And the governor's commitment, not only providing a brand new bridge to improve the quality of life in the region and the economy, but do it in a smart, affordable, and sensible way. Um, I'm just going to move off the BRT. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the final impact statements. I'm just going to go through some of the issues that are probably more important that are, that are highlighted there, but I, I let you all read the 750 pages. Okay. Um, the first thing you should know is that it's not our document. The document is the responsibility of the Federal Highway Administration. It's their document, they're calling the shots, they review everything that, that's done. And it's prepared on behalf of the Federal Highway Administration by the New York agency, the DOT, and the DOT. And then you have all of these agencies, because of your using the federal government resources, all of these agencies here provide resources and experts that get fed into the document. As it's prepared, as it's written, it gets reviewed by all of that that you see through there. So the document, as it, when it comes to you, and it was published yesterday, and it's on the website for anyone to do it, has been reviewed by a myriad of professionals, experts, and in so many categories that I, I couldn't dare try sum them up, but that gives you a sort of idea of what's going on. So in the document, there is about 3,000 comments that came from the DEIS. If I remember that was published in February, 45-day comment period was extended by about 15 days, if I remember correctly. Um, all of those comments are responded to in the EIS. Now, 
not all of them get an individual response because a lot of them were the same thing repeated a number of times. There might have been about 50 different themes that we could discuss or you see that are in, in the document. But every comment is responded to. Um, a lot of the comments were very positive. A lot of the comments were very positive. Um, people were very interested in a better, a safer, and improved operations on the bridge. What does that mean? Well, the existing bridge is unforgiving. If you have a break on Site. You can hear it when, when you're standing by the bridge. As traffic goes across the bridge, it's thump, 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 thump. You can see nodding heads in the audience. That's gone. That's removed. As you're driving from Rockland onto the bridge, what will happen in the future on the new bridge is that it's tilted slightly. So that it, tr it naturally takes you around the curve. You shouldn't have to turn your wheel at all. It takes you the right way. It forces you to do the right thing. All of these are issues that are taken care of, recognized, and say, okay, there's lots of positive going on with this. A lot of people have commented on the jobs, and a lot of people have recognized that the bridge is actually ready for transit. And you'll see in a moment, a lot of people didn't recognize that, saying that in, in a moment. So of the 50 themes, here's, here's three that people were, I think probably covered many maybe most of the impacts are the comments that were made. So it's the community impacts, impacts of the river, and really what's happening with transit. Now, I'll stop here just a moment to say that we're talking about the EIS, but there's also the procurement going up. So a lot of the things that the FEIS has concluded are in terms of commitments, in terms of details, are taken directly from this document. So what this document says, what has to be done by the bidders who are looking to build the bridge. But they're all connected, and they go through a whole bunch of people to make sure that everything is... But let me go through these three points just quite quickly. Community impacts. You'll probably, if you get to read the documents in great detail, you'll come across a thing called Tier 3. Tier 3 is an air quality level. And right now, the standard of air quality that's being looked at at the World Trade Center is Tier 2. All the equipment that's been used at the World Trade Center, because of when the project started or when the rebuilding started, was only what's called a tier two standard of air quality. Times have moved on. No project in the country has used tier three levels. We've used them, we've adopted them. We've gone more strict than anybody ever has done before. What that means is special pieces of kit that has to be added to new equipment or old equipment. Contractors have to go out and buy new equipment to make sure they're at the absolute highest level in terms of air quality. A little bit about noise. We did a pile testing program in the river some months ago. I'm sure lots of you probably heard it. But we learned an awful lot from that as to what you do to control the noise and to reduce the noise. Some of that money has been spent very wisely to see what we can do. For example, on some of the piles, what we learned was instead of hitting the piles in with a hammer, actually we can vibrate them in, which is awful lot less noise. What we've put into the procurement, we must maximize vibration. So all what's happening within the EAS is being fed through, and lots of very good things have come from the studies that have been done. I think there's one thing that I, I, I the last point that I, I'd like to emphasize is that the bridge on the river, the river is an important asset, but there is the possibility to deliver most of the bridge to be built from the river. That takes out of local communities in terms of its delivery. If, if things do come from the land, we're, we're blessed because at the end of the bridge is the throughway. Delivered from the throughway to the bridge without going into local routes and local properties. That's an important characteristic of the bridge that we, we tend to forget. Impacts on the river. <clears throat> Again, that pile testing program gave us an awful lot of information 
one of the things that you probably don't know is that, that fish have hearing as well and that they need to be protected and taken care of. And we did a number of different tests on the river to say how, what's the best way to maximize the noise reduction in aquatic life. And the best way turned out to be what's called a bubble curtain. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of a bubble curtain. But a bubble curtain is something that surrounds the construction and it releases bubbles from the riverbed up through the water. And that masks the noise, it traps the noise. So that's a tool that we're telling our contractors, you must do that. Here are some of the things that you must do to reduce the noise. And there's lots of little things like that that are happening. Now, there's two endangered species in the river, Ortno sturgeon and Atlantic sturgeon. The team put together all the facts associated with what happens with those fish. We've looked at it in extreme detail, and, and I think people should recognize that 10 years of study has gone into that. And the result of that is that the National Marine Fishery Service, one of those agencies that I mentioned at the beginning, have concluded that we will not endanger the species. That is a real important conclusion. That's not our conclusion. That's the experts who've looked at it for the federal government. That's a real important thing. And if you look at the detail in the EIS, interesting burn there from my point of view. Finally, in terms of transit. I said this is a positive thing, but people have said it's a negative thing too because they want some more information. And Tom said it already, the bridge is transit ready. It has enough space at BRT in the future if that's what the communities and the operations show that it's worthwhile. It has enough strength in addition to that to add commuter rail. What we're doing here is building an asset, as Brian said, not last for 50 years like the existing bridge, but he said up to 200 years. We're being clever to put in an asset that gives the absolute maximum value to the state of New York. How do we do that? We think we can't predict the future, we have to allow something to develop on that bridge in the future. That may be where I end. I believe we now move on to Larry Schwartz, Secretary of the Governor. He's going to take the next few slides. Uh, this is a new s slide in our presentation. Um, as many of you know, um, uh, the final environmental impact statement was posted on the website yesterday. We made a public announcement. Uh, we worked very hard to try to speed up uh, when the final environmental impact statement would be ready. It was not supposed to be ready before Friday, and we were able to get it a few days earlier, and we went out and posted it. But of course, I've gotten a number of phone calls from people that were concerned because when you hear F-E-I-S and the first word is final, that when you start to read the document, you begin to think that if something you care about is not in the document, therefore it won't happen, it won't occur. The one thing I just want to clear the air regarding the F-E-I-S, um, and hopefully uh, Mr. Padgett our attorney won't kick me under the table, even though I'm kind of far away. Uh, FEIS basically lays out at the minimum standards of the kind of mitigation work that will take place uh, on, with the new construction. This doesn't preclude the state for adding more things to the project. Uh, I promised when I went on News 12 about a month ago that I would meet with the homeowners of Key on the Westchester side, Salisbury on the Rockland side, uh, ho a number of homeowners in I, either South Nyack or Nyack, forgive me if I got my geography a little off. Uh, I've had a number of other community meetings. I plan to meet with other homeowners groups along the river. I went there to listen and learn to what their concerns are. I walked the Salisbury property with representatives of that group who appreciate and understand what their concerns are, to visualize them. I sat at a kitchen table at a, at, uh, I can't think of Alice's name. Condo is right on top of the bridge on the Westchester side. So I heard the issues and concerns about noise and air quality, impacts on the quality of life. And because it's not necessarily addressed in the FEIS, does not mean that your concerns are not going to be addressed. I promised you I would get back to all of you. I promised that we were going to go back and do a full uh, 
uh, due diligence effort to go back and look at all the transcripts, everything that was said in public meetings, in writing, not in writing. But when I came back to you as the governor's representative, when I came to you with a final answer, as opposed to the final environmental impact statement, you can count on that answer. Whether we have to then put it in writing, we will work with you to ensure that whether Larry Schwartz or Andrew Cuomo is here or not, those things that we promised will get done. So one is, I just want to emphasize that, that nobody who reads this FEIS should just take it as a given that issues that have been raised will not be addressed. I can't promise that every one of your concerns will be addressed, but I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, we will work with the homeowners and the local residents and our local governments to figure out where various different monitors go. There will be air quality monitors. There will be noise monitors. There will be vibration monitors, right? Because a lot of homeowners are worried about vibration impacts to their co-ops or condos or homes and the restitution that might have to be required if there's any structural da damage. We will work on where those monitors get placed, all right, so people feel that when there's a reading, it will be accurate and real. It will be real-time monitoring. It will be on the website. Anybody, whether you're a homeowner from Key or Salisbury or some other uh, homeowner along the river, anybody from the public will be able to log on to the website and see in a real-time basis what the noise is, what the air quality impacts or the vibration impacts are while the construction is going on. So I just want to first uh, have the opportunity to clarify that. I, hit, um, I want to talk about the process a little bit, the way the process uh, has been up till now and the way the new process, I see a number of our state legislators here and I, I want to thank them right up front. Uh, in 2011, Governor Cuomo introduced what's known as or called design-build legislation. We had a screwed up process that was not in the best interest of the taxpayers of New York State. The old process was when you wanted to do a road project or a bridge project or any kind of capital project, the first thing you did is you went out and hired someone to design the project. So you went through one entire bidding process and the engineers of a state agency would pick someone to design the project. When that got finished and everyone was satisfied with that design, you then had to bid out someone to actually build what was designed. Unfortunately, eight times or nine times out of ten, when the contractor started working on the project, he or she would find all kinds of problems. And they would sit there and say, whoever designed this didn't know what the hell they were doing. They didn't do this geotech this, and they don't, didn't do this study, and they didn't design it right. And we have to do all these change orders, which resulted in numerous cost overruns and numerous delays. If any of you are familiar uh, with 287, I live in White Plains. I've lived there since uh, 1997, okay? So I have lived with the construction over the last decade. From the Tappan Zee Bridge, I call the commissioner of DOT, I have a little pull now, and ask him when the work is going to get done at exit A East, where I get off every day. That, I gotta go here. That project, I think it's taken longer than 25% uh, of the completion rate uh, date that was expected. It's at least two years behind schedule, and it's 60 to 70 million dollars over budget. Well, guess who pays that 60 to 70 million dollars? It's not the contractor under the old way of doing business. It was all of you, me, the taxpayers in the state were on the hook and liable. Under design bill, the game has changed. Now, as was alluded to earlier, we started out with four design teams, design teams that were interested in bidding on the new Tappan Zee Bridge internationally well-known teams. Companies that have built bridges all throughout the world, some of the biggest, best bridges throughout the world. And they all 
various teams joined forces, three out of the four bidders uh, submitted bid. But what, what is unique, and thanks to the support and the cooperation of our state senators and state assembly members that passed the legislation that Governor Cuomo introduced in 2011, these teams have, are now responsible for both designing and bidding on their own designs. They're basically saying, what we design, we can build it at this price that we're bidding on. All the risk, all the cost have now shifted over to the bidder and not onto the taxpayer anymore. And that's key. They are responsible for delays. They are responsible for cost overrun. It's no, not going to be the state of New York or the taxpayers of the state. The three bids. You can see from the picture there, this just shows you how comprehensive uh, and thorough the FEIS is and how comprehensive the bidding process is. These are the three bids that came in by 4 o'clock on Friday. As you can see, 70 boxes. 750,000 sheets of paper, okay, hundreds of pounds. They had to actually bring them in on those wooden pallets, okay, when they got here. And as part of now the process, uh, we have assembled some of the best and brightest uh, bridge builders, engineers, architects, bridge designers to begin looking at these various proposals. They're reviewing the proposals for completeness and compliance. We're doing this with the federal government, who is the lead agency on this um, uh, process. One thing that I have said uh, from the very beginning when the governor uh, asked me towards the end of the legislative session to get engaged and involved on the, on the Tap and Z Bridge process, that we are going to make this procurement process is open and is apparent as we're legally allowed to do. We are walking through with the lawyers right now in the federal government. We are talking to the bidders to make sure that we can create a public process where you understand what's involved in these bids, what the designs are going to look like. Uh, we just ask for your patience because there's issues regarding proprietary information don't want to be sued by any of the bidders. We don't want to be in violation of any federal laws. Um, one of the things that the governor is also committed to do, and I think it was a suggestion that was made to him by Scenic Hudson, who I had a meeting with earlier today with Riverkeeper and um, in Tri-State is Transit Group, um, is we're going to create a blue ribbon panel slash selection committee that, again, will not only be made up of some of the best experts in the bridge world, uh, but we're also going to have people from Westchester County and Rockland County government, as well as other representatives of the public, to be able to weigh in on the aesthetics and design uh, of a new Tap and Zee Bridge. And we're working on through that process right now. I can't, I don't have anything to announce tonight, uh, but we hope to have an announcement shortly how that process will take place. Last thing I want to talk to you about is, um, you know, there's two phases to this project. Maybe there's more, but I look, at least look at this project in two phases. One is leading up to the beginning of construction, and one is during construction. Okay. We are here. We are not going anywhere. I am, I live in Westchester County. I've been living here since 1993, White Plains since 1997. The governor asked Brian Bear to join the team. Okay. Brian lives in Elmsford in Westchester County. He, what did I say? <laughs> huh? I'm sorry. Eastchester. Okay. <coughs> It transplanted them fast. Uh, that's where we're going to put the dedicated BRT line. Uh, 
No one said over our dead body, by the way. Um, Amy Vargas, who Brian mentioned, a Rockland County resident. Uh, we're opening up offices uh, next to the Thruway Authority office in Tarrytown. We're adding more members of the team. They will be from the Westchester Rockland area. We are here. We are residents. We serve the state government, but we serve you. We are going to be here. We're going to be out in your communities. We're going to be proactively talking to you. Brian is here. Amy is here 24-7. I have a few other responsibilities. Uh, besides the Tappan Zee Bridge as Secretary to Governor, I, I can't promise you I'm here 24-7, but I'm going to be here a lot. I've been here a lot over the last month. I've got my commitment. I'm going to be here. But we are here, boots on the ground, to answer your questions, to respond to things, get you answers, get your input. So we are here to represent you. The governor is going to hire what's known as an owner's representative. You are the owner. The government is the owner. So while the contractor will have his own team to work with the community, we will have our own team to work with the contract, to work with our local government partners, to work with the business community, homeowners, all our stakeholders. Last thing I just want to mention is, as part of our uh, public outreach effort, uh, we opened up, uh, some of you may have already tested it or used it. Uh, we have a toll-free number you see here on PowerPoint. In addition, we have a new website. Uh, our commitment, my commitment, Brian's commitment, all our commitment is if anyone calls with a question, won't be someone the man at 24-7 or staff at 24-7. Uh, well, our commitment is there will be someone to staff it during the day. Uh, whether you get a live body or you leave a message, we will get back to you in 24 to 48 hours. Okay? With an answer to your question. And if Brian or me or Amy doesn't know the answer, we will go to the right source to get that answer. So we're here. Governor is committed. I'm speaking as, as, as his representative, as Secretary Brian, as his special advisor Amy, uh, a member of the team. We are here. We're committed to work with you, to listen, to learn, to be clear and concise and straightforward so you trust us. But when you give us, when we give you an answer, that's the final answer, and the, that answer, that commitment will not change in the future. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of other people on the panel as well. They're going to help us answer questions because that's why we're here to stay, okay, is to answer all your questions. I'm being told an awful lot of these question cards. If we don't get to yours tonight, as Larry just promised, I will call you or email you in the next 24 to 48 hours. So if we don't get to yours We also have a number of distinguished uh, partners from local government here. I want to give them the courtesy uh, to say a few short words in with uh, Rockland County Clerk Paul Piperano, I'm told. Uh, you, okay. Come on down to uh, one of the microphones. Now. So when I call your name, if you have filled out a card, you can come to either one of these two microphones. That way everybody will be able to hear you. I just have a simple statement. I just want to uh, thank all of you for being here tonight, uh, providing the information that we need to make a uh, an intelligent uh, decision and uh, in support of this project. I have to commend the governor uh, for putting an end to all the studies, uh, for taking the bull by the horn and getting this project off the drawing board. Uh, and it's and, and definitely it's transparency that, uh, that he's allowing the public to be totally involved all the way through the process. We're not talking about just building a bridge here not just the tap in Sea Bridge as we know it. It's going to be an infusion to the Hudson Valley economy, New York State, and it's going to show the nation and the world that New York State is ready to invest in itself again. So it's going to create jobs, it'll, it'll improve our economy, and put us back on the road to recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Piperato. We appreciate your input. We also want to hear from the chairwoman of the Rockland County Legislature, Harriet Cornell. Harriet, I saw her somewhere. Uh, there she is. Come on. We'd like to hear from you as well tonight. Good 
Good evening, and thank you very much for coming to Rockland once again. Um, like Larry Schwartz, no project has consumed my thoughts more than the uh, Tappanzi Bridge project. I was in my car in 1998 or 1999 when I heard Governor Pataki say there was going to be a new bridge and I almost drove off the road. Uh, I, uh, uh, there have been four governors uh, over this period of time. And uh, because I had heard over the years many tales of homes that had been lost to the thruway and the bridge well over 50 years ago, I wanted residents of my county to be informed take heed and be aware of the potential impacts and to participate in the process. So that's the role I have played over these many years, particularly since 2005 when I became chair of the legislature and set up regular summits for exchanges of information and ideas between state officials and residents. Um, I actually recommended the formation of the stakeholder working groups and, uh, and recommended people to serve on them. So residents came to understand the challenges and appreciated the way the professional staff, including, I might add, Mark Roche, who was part of that, uh, the professional staff sought to overcome the challenges with the least adverse impact on communities. So I'm, at this point, I am so truly pleased by the in-depth presentations that Governor Cuomo's team has been giving to the public. I applaud the transparency and openness with the community. I attended a meeting similar to this about eight or nine days ago and found it very helpful and very reassuring. And tonight I learned even more, particularly about bubble wrap and the sturgeon. Um, I was away for a few days, so I haven't had time to read or uh, the, the FEIS and certainly not to digest it. And I'll be going through it over the next week. Uh, I'm particularly pleased about the blue ribbon panel. It's something that I consider very, very important to have a design that is in fitting with the uh, beauty of the Hudson Valley. So I, I love that idea. Um, I believe that the accelerated Tapanzi Bridge project is a priority. A safe and modern bridge is of paramount importance to the region, the state, and the entire Northeast certainly to those commuters who drive it every day, and certainly to those people who are going to be building it for us. I appreciate the commitment to building a bridge that will be able to handle commuter rail, bus rapid transit in the future, and that dedicated lanes will be used immediately for express bus across the bridge. I've already shared some of my thoughts with Governor Cuomo, with Larry Schwartz on design, on transit, on the environment, uh, so I won't go through that tonight. I just wanted to say that over the years I have testified at many hearings, uh, MTA hearings, DOT hearings, uh, Port Authority hearings, and uh, I think it's important to remember that Rockland and west of Hudson communities are really the orphan of the transportation system in the region. We don't have that one seat ride. And I know that with the governor that we have, the man of action that he is, he can really work with the state of New Jersey to see that we get better service on the Pascack Valley Line and maybe, maybe even take up the West Shore Railroad as well. So thank you all for being here and thank you for reaching out to our community. Thanks. Thank you, Chairwoman Harriet Cornell. Uh, we also like to welcome State Senator William Larkin. We'd like to say a few words, sir. Panel members, uh, I'm an old soldier, 23 years of active duty, and I've heard many presentations, some as a young lieutenant and some as a colonel given. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, in my career, this is the best presentation I've ever heard, and they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> the governor has taken a bold stance. As Larry said, he called many of us in the Senate in and said, it is time to do something, but to do it properly. This, this issue is going to be an economic boost to our area. We have people out of work. This will create thousands of jobs, thousands of key jobs, not sweeping a broom or something, technicians. 
But I liked one of the biggest things I liked when I heard the first briefing was the fact that the governor is so set on making sure that each and every one of us have an opportunity to look at this and look at it from our own perspective. This is a serious matter. And if he said it once, Schwartz, you can correct me, he said it three or four times. We cannot walk away from the safety issue surrounding a project of this magnitude. When we talked about the bubble, when I first heard it, I didn't know. And my grandson said, Grandpa, I'll show you. Now I know. Very important. <laughs> but you know, I hear people say, let's, do, let's not do anything until we do the rail. Let's not do this here. This project that the governor has put together for a bridge, in my opinion, is the right thing at the right time for the right needs and the necessities of both counties. We can always add to it. You know, when you give your child a, an allowance, and as they get older and they mature, you add another dollar. They like you a lot better. But we're going to look at that. You know, not the same. Well, let me just say that I support this 150%. I think that this is an issue that has been dragged and dragged and dragged. My big thing as a legislature when I see them asking for new money for it, new money for it, and you're just putting patches over patches over patches, and we're not doing addressing something. One of the things that Tom and the gentleman to your side, Mark said, about pulling over to the side. I've crossed over this bridge, and I've seen vehicles stop, trucks. And there's always that question of somebody's going to bang into them. What we've done in this new plan, I shouldn't say we, what the key people have, has said to this, this is a plan that's needed. I want to tell you, I support this 150%. The team the governor has put together, we should all be proud. Because let me tell you something, they're not working an hour a day or half an hour. The hours are immense, but they're committed. And so is the governor and the rest of us that support you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate your support, sir. How about uh, State Assemblyman Ken Zabrowski? Would you like to say a few words, sir? We are going to get to your questions as well. I have a whole lot of those. So thank you, and I'll be brief so you can get to the uh, public concerns. Let me first thank the governor and his staff for coming here today. You know, in Rockland uh, County over the past decade, I guess, probably maybe before, since Governor Pataki first said that he would rebuild a new Tappan Zee Bridge, it sort of became a joke. When you were going to describe something as being absurd, you'd say, yeah, I'll do that when the new Tappan Zee Bridge is built. But really, this governor has taken the bull by the horns and brought this project to where it is now. And are there concerns? Are there environmental concerns? Are there mass transit concerns? Certainly. But the reason why we're even having this conversation, that we're in this room today, is because the governor and because you folks uh, up on this panel have done all the hard work and really, even in this economy, brought this very necessary project to uh, the forefront. Um, your outreach uh, to the community is welcomed. Um, we thank you for coming here today. Certainly, the governor hasn't just dispatched uh, a couple of interns. Um, he's certainly bring, brought his team that is truly making the decisions and advising him to our communities, and that's important for everybody to see in Rockland and Westchester counties. Um, just a couple comments. Um, I'm glad to see uh, uh, Secretary Schwartz, you've said that this is going to be, that the, the report that came out yesterday is almost a, a minimum standards, that you're going to, I ask that you continue to uh, be sensitive and continue to monitor, because things will inevitably change. Things that uh, were said are going to go one way, may go a different way, and I'm glad you're going to have all those monitors uh, in place and will take, uh, uh, take into account the concerns and uh, what's going on in the living rooms and in the kitchens of the residents that are surrounding that property. You know, just a couple questions on mass transit. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that the governor has said that this project will be mass transit ready, and I agree with you in terms of getting this up and going, and that it is uh, probably cost prohibitive at this point to do the full corridor project. I would just say that I think what I've heard from my constituents is that they want to see that they're perhaps 
uh, as this project is going on or as it's completed, that there are set goals and standards that they can look to. What they're concerned about is that this project will be built, it'll be on the back burner, it'll be in another part of the state, and this will be something that languishes for 30 or 40 years, whereas if we recognize that this is a necessary transportation corridor, not only probably for this region, but for the entire state and the entire nation, that we could have a set sort of standards or goals that the public can look to. Um, when you're looking at the bids, I ask that you keep that in mind so that should there be a mass transit, whether it's BRT or light rail component in the future, you look at these bids so that you see what the impact may be in the communities five, ten years from now when that full corridor is going in so that we minimize those impacts. I don't want to you know, be in a room five or ten years and say, well, we can't do that to minimize the impact on our communities because the way the, build, the bridge was built five or ten years, so I ask for that type of forward thinking. And just lastly, uh, in terms of the tolls, that you recognize for, that for Rockland commuter, commuters, we don't have a one-seat ride into the city. So that when you look at the toll structures, um, you look into um, both uh, commuter reductions, but also reductions based upon where we are. We have to use the bridge. We can't really get back from Westchester or back from the city without going over the Tappan Zee Bridge or the George Washington Bridge and paying those tolls. I know Staten Island has a uh, reduction. I ask that that type of mechanism be looked into for, for Auckland County as well. In fact, I introduced the bill this year, uh, 9881, to do just that. Um, and I just think that we shouldn't look at this as just the residents of Westchester and Rockland who go over the bridge have to pay for it. You know, if you look at other transportation <coughs> projects around the state, I don't believe the residents of Manhattan are paying, footing the full bill for the 2nd Avenue subway project. And I don't think the full bill should rest on the shoulders of Rockland and Westchester. So I ask as you look for that, that we consider that as well. But frankly, I, I really want to reiterate my thanks to the governor for really getting this project up and running and for the, the way he's brought forth his team to really listen to the public. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more uh, local government uh, elected official, and then we'll get to your questions. Uh, Supervisor Christopher St. Lawrence of the town of Brown votes, sir. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I remember as a small child uh, when the throughway was built and the Tappan Zee Bridge was first constructed. I can remember when they were uh, going into the approaches of the Ramapo Gap and blasting and the stones would land on our roof on Utopian Avenue and suffering and my mother would say to me, come on Christopher, we're going down to the village hall and we're going to uh, see what's going on. You know, my mother is now 93 years old and the bridge needs to be replaced. I'm concerned about 93 years from now. And so, Brian, we're all going to stay around for 100 years to make sure that uh, you're right in your comment. But the important thing is, is that, as Senator Larkin had said, the hour is now. And we cannot let the inspiration of this hour fade as we go into this project. There is no question that the governor's plan is the right plan. It's the right plan for the region. It's the right plan for New York State. But what I find to be very heartening is the fact that the environmental impact statement that was re released yesterday has aggressive rules. We've heard about some of these new uh, standards that are going to be put in place for this project. I think it is very important that we, we look to protect the resources and natural resources of the river, the community, and the entire corridor. So I commend uh, this entire process and uh, this incredible outreach to do the right thing and to build the right bridge. And I really want to finally say, in closing, I want to thank uh, Larry Schwartz for stepping up to the plate, as the governor has asked him to do, for this incredible team that is here. And the fact that we've had 430 meetings over the past 10 years, but now we're going to have in-depth meetings with the public and the incredible outreach that is going on. So I want to commend all of you on this project. It is the right time. It's the time to do this. It's the right interest for the economics and for the safety of our community. And thank you. Assembly uh, Ellen Jaffe, would you like to say a few words as well? Well, thank you very much. I've been a part of those 10 years of, of meetings. Uh, I don't want to be repetitive because I know there are many questions, but I do want to thank you for being here and I want to thank the governor for putting together such an, 
you know, a really very a good team with, with extraordinary expertise. And I'm very pleased about how responsive um, the governor has been and, and you have been in terms of looking at the very real issues of concern that are being raised by the community and the ongoing public meetings and, and, and being able to have this dialogue is absolutely essential. And, and I want to say that we truly appreciate that. I also want to just briefly mention something that hasn't been uh, mentioned before and I, and I do want to reiterate the very real need for looking at the economic development and the businesses, especially in the river villages, in terms of uh, providing them assistance uh, in moving forward to uh, during that construction phase. And also, uh, given what happened with the building of the first bridge uh, in South Nyack, the loss of that economic opportunity, perhaps we can work together, and I know you promised, uh, Larry, that we're going to have that meeting, um, to talk to the local businesses and, and local leaders in the community to assure that we can give South Nyack and Nyack area the opportunity to get that economic development back and to be able to help the local residents with their property taxes as well and through this time. Thank you. All right, now, folks, your questions. I welcome Fran Oldenberger of Blaville to come on down to the microphone. You're welcome to ask your question. Fran, are you still here? Thank you for being here, and I appreciate all the expertise. It's really great to see this coming together. Um, I first wanted to find out um, how much will the bridge cost, and more importantly, how will it be financed? And then I had two quick comments. One would be that, um, are you changing the name of the bridge? Because I noticed it says New York Bridge, and it is historically significant for this area, and I don't think that should any way be overlooked. And um, uh, also, I would, also suggest trying to use as many American companies as possible for this. We all need to keep this home. Uh, on the cost question, as we mentioned in the presentation, we have estimated the project of this open scale and what we put in general specifications for the world-class teams that Larry talked about on. We looked at a maximum of the, at the range of about $5.2 billion. And that's the number that the Federal Highway Administration has approved and estimated. What we're hoping for in this design build best value procurement, which is new, I was said about the new law and how important it is for controlling costs, ensuring schedule, and giving the taxpayers, toll payers, the best use of their dollars. We expect to see some competitive bids from these teams. We're hoping, not guaranteeing at this point, and while we got those uh, 750,000 pages, we haven't seen the price yet. Part of this process is to study the technical aspects and then open the envelope on the price once we look at the technical, uh, technical bids. So uh, we're hoping that it, it could have been less than $5.2 billion. That's the range. Your other question is how will it be financed? And as we've said consistently, publicly, the centerpiece of the financing, and really the primary way of financing this bridge is going to be pulled back for way bonds. Now we're also going to be, have been, and we will continue to pursue vigor vigorously federal support, specifically federal support in the form of a long-term low interest loan that will help us in the project. And we have requested a billion dollar loan from the federal government. So uh, we need to wait until we understand whether or not we're going to get that or some other amount. The amount that we get will have a relationship with what those ultimate bid prices are when we open the envelope file. So those two pieces are key variables that we need to understand to finalize our plan of finance that we expect to have done probably uh, next month or so. That'll be on the website as soon as you get that. How we're funding finance? And will the name Tappan Z be changed? Is that under consideration? I know we have a new website. I think that was a domain name internet thing. Are we changing the name of the bridge? Do we know? 
There's no answer to that question right now. <laughs> okay, I mean, well, what do you, do you want the name to change? Do you want the same name? I'm not saying we're changing the name. I don't know how to answer the question. I'm trying to give you an honest answer. I don't, it's never come up before. I don't, I'm, I've, I've never been part of any discussion about changing the name. So I will promise we'll get back to you with an answer to that question. It, well, it also was named after that, but I don't, I don't think too many people <laughs> supervise and know that. Its technical name right now is the Gover Governor Malcolm Wilson Evans Ebridge. That's his technical name. All right, Rita Van of New City, uh, you have a question, I believe. Rita, are you still here? All right, come on down with your question. I need to put you on the spot there, Larry. So I never come up. I, We'll go for the Larry Schwartz bridge. <laughs> I don't want to bring too much. Uh, first, forgive my ignorance with my question. Maybe my first meeting ending about the bridge, but is it definitive that it's accepted going to go forward project? And secondly, if it is or will be, what is the timeline? Is there a timeline construction? So I realize there could be complications. Larry, you want to handle that one? Yeah. Governor, we're moving forward with building a brand new bridge. Um, uh, our goal is to try to begin construction by the end of this year, the beginning of 2013. Um, my understanding is that it will take about 25 years. When they say the five years, though, is like a grace period that could go on to the pageant? Well, hopefully, as I mentioned earlier, on the design bill, it's going to take five years. It's going to be five years, not five and a half, not six, not seven, like it would have been under the old way of designing the building. Thank you. But Tom, I'd just like to add a comment to, to that. And, and well, again, like the $5 billion estimate, the five years is also an estimate at this point. And we won't know definitively until we see those three proposals and we find, you know, we're going through the technical information, how they're uh, presenting their designs, how they would be constructed. We may see a bid that says they can do it in less than five years. There may be some complexities to a certain type of design work that take a little bit more. So, uh, there is some flexibility there, and again, we'll know more when we... Larry has asked me to condense the 750,000 pages to have that form in the morning. And I believe uh, the final environmental impact statement that came out this week uh, gives a range of 4.5 to 5.5 years. Is that correct, Dave Padgett? Yeah. So there is a little wiggle room. Nobody knows. That's when those boxes are open. Exactly. That, that will tell us an awful lot. Uh, all right. Let me see if I can read this handwriting. Robert um, Borman, perhaps? Robert Borman of South Nyack. Are you here, sir? Yes. Great. Come on down. Did I get your name right? Yes, I'm uh, wondering if they're still planning on putting a bike and a walking path on the new bridge? Yes. It is absolutely included in the uh, FEIS and all the bidders have to include it. Right? Thank you. Not only are we putting the, the bike and walking path on the bridge, we're also putting on what are called Belvedere's. If you look at on the bridge, you can stop and enjoy doing it. Those are maybe some art on the bridge as well. So lots of clever ideas coming up. Should be interesting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Margaret Williams of South Nyack. I believe that says Margaret. Are you here? Specifically, who? is the ombudsman that's been appointed by the governor directly responding to the governor. 
that we can talk to? Uh, I, I think that's me. I, I, don't, I don't have the title ombudsman, but I am special advisor to the governor, uh, and my job, he has tasked me with answering everyone's questions. Uh, if I don't get to your question card tonight, I will call you or email you in the next 24 to 48 hours. So I don't know what the legal definition of an ombudsman is, Dave Padgett might know, uh, but I am here to answer everyone's questions, uh, to work with residents, to work with business folks, to work with elected officials, uh, and, and I will answer your questions. So if you, I, I'll have my card afterwards if you'd like it. Uh, you can also use that phone number or go on to newnewyorkbridge.com. You can leave a question there. I'm the guy who winds up calling you or emailing you back. Okay? Uh, Oren Getz of Clarkstown, do you have a question, sir? Yes, uh, with the financing not all in place, uh, how do we know how much the tolls are going to go up on the bridge when the new bridge is built? That is a good question, and Larry Schwartz alluded to that. Yes, I did. I, as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the different options, I, and you saw it on the PowerPoint, we're looking at, um, I think it was option two, when you looked at New Bridge with the full BRT build-out, you're looking at a $10 billion number. I've said for probably the last three to four weeks that you were looking at a 28 to $30 toll when the bridge opened in 2017. So if you just walk back and you look at just building the bridge at somewhere in the range of $5 billion, you're certainly looking at a toll in 2017 at least half of that. And what I've said a number of times in public is that you know, you're probably looking at something that is comparable to the George Wa less or comparable to the George Washington Bridge. You're probably looking at something like 14, less than 14 on a cash basis. That's what people that don't have an easy pass, don't have a commuter easy pass discount. Where the George Washington Bridge in 2015 at $15, and I'm sure by 2017, uh, unfortunately, we'll probably be more than $15 toll. So, uh, and again, if you looked at option one, which is, I call it the do nothing option, which is basically just repair, 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 <coughs> you're looking at three to four billion dollars. You're talking about $12 uh, projected toll. So the difference between what you have now no shoulders, no emergency lane, uh, a bridge that has twice the accident rate, any other single mile of the entire New York State throughway system. It's a dangerous bridge. Height is narrow. Okay. You're going to end up, it's basically going to be a $2 difference between that and the state of the bridge. We <laughs> talked about the four lanes, emergency lane, quieter bridge and a bridge that will have a bike and pedestrian path, uh, they'll be better for the region. Thank you, sir. Uh, Joan Sullivan of South Nyack, you have a question. Are you still here? Come on down. That's news, by the way, folks. No one has mentioned that number. Well, a difference to me, it's no brainer. I had a, a number of questions, try to keep them simple. Uh, my first question is, I'm not, well, it's not a question, it's a statement. I'm not an engineer, an occupational therapist. I look at things critically, I look at human performance critically, and I adapt that performance based on needs. I've looked at this bridge. Um, and you're telling me that it's going to be five lanes in each direction, basically. I can't quite figure out how those five lanes are going to merge into the existing 287 corridor, which are three lanes, and how that is not going to cause the same kind of congestion that we have now. Matter of fact, one of your engineers uh, at one of the meetings and I don't know if he said it flippantly or not, but I raised the question of uh, the noise on the bridge. Engineer, I think it was Mr. Conway, said, oh, we expect the noise to be reduced. 
and we all said, how can it be reduced? It's going to be 200 feet closer to our house. He said, well, there's going to be so much congestion on the bridge, traffic isn't going to be moving, and there will be no noise. I believe that's the exact opposite, Mark Roach. Yeah. How can you take the five lanes and put them into the existing lanes? Second part of my question is with the, the bus, dedicated bus lane, um, once you're on the other side of the bridge, okay, the, the bus has own lane going across the bridge, where does that bus go when it gets on the other side if you don't have a separate lane for it? You can't take away an existing lane on the other side of the bridge because that would then reduce the, uh, the traffic lanes. So where is the benefit of having a dedicated lane on the bridge and have it funnel into the existing traffic lanes? Mark Roach, you want to reply to that one? Yeah. Um, you can't take five lanes and put them into three. And we're not doing that. Okay, how is it going to be? It, it's four lanes in each direction. And here at the existing bridge, which is a total of seven lanes, we're having eight on the new bridge. But the existing bridge operates as an eight lane bridge because you know the movable barrier moves every day. We're in the peak hour. So it's effectively an eight lane bridge. And we're putting in exactly an eight lane bridge. With wider shoulders. That, that's a bit of a difference. Wider shoulders. Um, but if you would imagine coming across Rockland, you've got four lanes coming off about four lanes in South Nyack. It runs straight into those. At the top of the hill, at Interchange 11, it goes down to three. And that's where you get a bit of a chop. That's, that's an issue. That's an operating issue. And I, I know Marie Lorenzi <laughs> yeah, is concerned about that. Um, and that's an issue. That, it's kind of outside what we're looking at for the bridge right now. But that's an issue of what we call traffic balance. All right, look, um, we're not doing five lanes. We, we can't do any more lanes that, that join in. That's not the objective. The objective is for growth to happen. It's a transit solution. No more lanes. You can't build your way out of congestion. You can't do it. Around the world, the more lanes you build, you build, or they fill up, it doesn't work. It's a transit solution. Um, you asked one other question, what happens with the bus lane as it would come off the bridge? Right now, operation when, when the bridge would open. It would run for the three miles on the bridge. It really can't go that much further if you don't modify the lanes on each side. And it would have to come back into general traffic. But to add a lane for that bus would affect there's folks that live in South Nyack. It would affect the folks at the fees. But that's not for us to decide. You know, we're, we're trying to get the most out of this bridge, this asset. But it's going to take an awful lot more of us to get together to say, well, how do we make the best one to come off the bridge? That, that's a much bigger question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am, for your question. We appreciate it. How about uh, Gil Hawkins, uh, uh, the Hudson River Fishermen's Association, perhaps? Come on down, sir. Oh, that's all right. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, uh, basically, I think this whole process has happened backwards. And the reason why I'm saying that is because you called for comments on the DEIS. And so all of us got ready to make comments on the DEIS. And those were supposed to be final. And when we made our final comments, then the FEIS came out. I just got the discs yesterday, and I'm very happy to try to read them. Uh, I haven't gotten very far, but um, it, it, it's a process. The problem is now um, with, the, with the final comments that we put in, now you're saying, but come on, comment some more. And we have nothing to comment on. We don't have any designs. Um, we don't know whether the bridge is going to be 200 stanchions or whether it's going to be 400 stanchions. Um, 
And what you're saying is that we have to trust the companies that are going to put in these, these, these bids, these processes, with, uh, based on a design, a DEIS, that we really had nothing, we had no way of, of, of basing our, our, our situation on. So what I'm saying is, if you're worried about the river, and you're worried about the sturgeon, and if you're worried about the striped bass and the eels and everything else that is so important to the river, we don't know what's going to be out there. We have no idea. And so if you're saying that this situation is now changing, becoming plastic, and that is that we now have the ability to make comments, and we have the ability to change things, then we would like to know that. Because that's, that's very important to us. And we also want to know that you are plastic, that you are flexible, and that you will do the things that you have just explained. And that is, you're talking about the bubble curtain. Well, what about the migrating striped bass in the fall and in the spring? What about the herring and the eels and all the, the other fish, other than the ones that are on the endangered species list? because we don't want them to be endangered in the Hudson River either. So we're trying to work with you all, trying to understand the process. Right now, we're all up in the air. Uh, it is a little complicated. Uh, there is a 30-day window, as I understand it right now, since the final environmental impact statement comes out, you can make comments on it. Is, is that correct? There is nothing aberrational odd or unorthodox about this process. Nothing unique to this process. The draft environmental impact statement by all respects with law or several comments, Mr. Hawkins, it essentially operated on the basis of examining what the worst case envelope might be. Admittedly, there was no design. But indeed, the draft EIS emerged here with rather more detail with respect to what the design envelope might be than is typically the case with transportation projects. So it wasn't suffering from the paucity of detail. For any of you who have tried to make your way through it, it's rather the opposite used of being turgid, loaded, and all that was an effort to provide as much detail from the public to address the concerns of the gauntlet of agencies that are engaged in the review of this document. So for example, when you speak of the various fish species, the draft EIS addresses those concerns. The FEIS goes beyond the level of detail that was contained in the draft EIS, and among other things, for example, reflects the scrutiny that was undertaken by various resource agencies, who, if you're familiar with, are not disposed to giving you free passes. They examine these documents in excruciating detail. I'm referring, for example, to the Department of Environmental Conservation, the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service. But we have had to demonstrate to them that we have satisfactorily set forth the potential impacts of the project, that we have addressed those impacts by providing mitigation. So I think if you're in need of a cure for insomnia, for viewing, <laughs> We're reviewing the final environmental impact statement, which is not 750 pages, it's several thousands of pages. Now, I'm not suggesting that mere girth is the equivalent of quality. I, I, I wouldn't suggest that. But I think you will review it and you will find that it's comprehensive. It addresses all of the impacts. And one of the things that we're finding Mark alluded to the testing that was done 
of the piles over the course of several months at a cost in excess of $20 million. So we have taken examination beyond what's normally done. This wasn't a paper modeling exercise. This was a live examination undertaken by one of the foremost entities in the world to try to determine what are the noise levels associated with pile driving. And what emerged is that what appears in the draft EIS in terms of how noisy the activity will be, how far the area in which sound pressure levels will extend, how many fish may be affected by those noise levels, guess what? We exaggerated. We predicted far more than is evidenced by the empirical tests that were undertaken. So I, I could go on at length, but I think your concerns have really been addressed in a very thorough and careful, wholesome manner. I just want to make a comment to that, and that is I've been on the stakeholders committee for since the beginning, and I've been to just about every meeting, and I have made my comments very clear about my concern for the river. And by the way, I am, your, I am not only your biggest, biggest critic, but I'm also your biggest supporter in the fact that this, is, the, the, this business has been very, very thorough. So I'm not criticizing that situation, I'm criticizing the process. And the process has been backwards. And maybe that's because it has to do with, it had to do with the Federal Transportation Commi Commission and the way that it had to be done with, with the federal government. I don't necessarily want to get into that right now. But what I am hoping, and I really, really, really support your efforts to continue to monitor the health of the river throughout this process, and that we are aware of the fact a bubble curtain is just one of many, many, many things that can happen. And one of the situations, and I'll be very brief about this, was there are anecdotal stories on the river from people like the river keeper and from Gabrielson in, in West Nyack, in Nyack, and other people who could have added to this, this whole study, and it, and it didn't happen. And so I was, uh, I was a little um, uh, upset about the fact that you didn't reach out to the fishermen other than myself and a few other people. But now that the process has changed, I hope that you will do the same thing as the study you did with the, with the, the pilings in the river and understanding and finding out what is happening to the river and the health of the river. So thank you very much for, for listening to my comments. If I could just say, um, I just want to say uh, that you know, as part of this process, we're here to listen to the community, work with the community, happy to meet with you and your organization, to listen to your ongoing concerns, it's an ongoing process to learn and listen to work. And if there are ways in which we can improve the project, we're open to finding those ways, working, including those ways uh, to make it the best project possible. That's wonderful. Thank you. And, and one other thing, uh, Mark Roach, it, my understanding in the FEIS that there will be uh, fish experts on the barges during construction, so if any endangered species get trapped. Resource agencies, independent experts will be there to make sure that not only are, are we watching, but if anything happens, there's a recovery process. We, we will engage an array of monitors. We will be monitoring water quality, be monitoring the benthic population. There will be National Marine Fisheries service approved endangered species specialist. Uh, I'm being told this is the final question so right now, but if I didn't get to your question, you wrote one down, I will get back to you in the next 24 to 48 hours, but we were supposed to end about 15 minutes ago. This one is Ed, I can't really read that. Ied, K-N-Y, F-D, maybe? Am I screwing that up? Okay, so he's from Valley Cottage. Please welcome Ed. Thank you, Thank you for your question. 
Um, I'm just kind of delving into a lot of the, the stuff here on the bridge now, just curiosity about as this, if this project goes forward, and not knowing what's going on in Washington, budgets and all that stuff. Um, for the daily commuter, what kind of impacts does or do you expect daily? I don't commute daily on the bridge, but my wife does. But over the course of, let's say, five years, the expected construction time, what impact does a daily commuter have? On the current span during construction. Right. Uh, Mark? Yeah. Um, Stated the requirements of the construction process that at all times the existing seven lanes remain operational. And, and how that's achieved is by effectively building a new bridge parallel to the existing. And that there comes a time at the landing where the new bridge lies on top of where the old bridge is. So we've staged the new and the old bridge in house such that we always get seven lanes. And in fact, Switch to eight lanes as quick as possible. Yeah, I, I think what happens on some construction sites is that people take a look and traffic slows down. It tends to happen, but what, what also happens is people get fed up looking after a while and traffic moves along. Um, so you know, we, we expect that there might be some disturbance in a couple of months where people are getting used to things happening, but after that, it'll, it'll just go back to seven lanes as normal. Thank you. Sir. All right, again, if you did fill out a question card, I will get back to you. Uh, I will call you. I will email you. Thank you all for being here. And thanks again for watching.